welcome to week three of Print Month. Um, today, we have the first of two programs with our friends at Print Council of America. Um, today, we're with uh, the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum for a program on the DeClue Collection. Um, the second program with PCA will be next week on Friday, October 27th, uh, at the IFPDA Print Fair at the Javits Center with Susan Dackerman uh, for a program on Durer and the Islamic East. Um, before I turn the program over to my friend, Mary Weaver Chapin, um, just a reminder that today's program is being recorded. If you need to leave early, you'll be able to catch the end of the program on our YouTube channel in the coming weeks. Uh, if you have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box and we'll get to them at the end. And with that, I'm very, very happy to turn it over to my dear friend, Mary Weaver Chapin. Thanks, Jenny. I'm delighted to be here. I'm Mary Weaver Chapin. I'm the president of Print Council of America and curator of prints and drawings at the, Portla at the um, Portland Art Museum in Portland, Oregon. We are delighted to be part of Print Month every year with the IFPDA, and it is always a pleasure to highlight the work of our members. Um, the Print Council has now for more than 65 years been a forum for um, print curators, print uh, specialists, conservators, and specialists in photography and drawings to come together and collaborate it's really a joy to uh, share our work with the public and you can find our research tool index to catalogs raisonne of works of art on paper um, at printcouncil.org. It's a free online resource and it's a great help to those of you studying works of art on paper. I'd like to thank Jenny Gibbs and the entire team at the IFPDA, and it is my pleasure now to introduce our speakers. We have uh, three distinguished guests today, and I'll start with Caitlin Condell. Uh, Caitlin is the Associate Curator and Head of the Department of Drawings, Prints, and Graphic Design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, New York. There, she oversees a collection of nearly 147,000 works on paper dating from the 14th century to the present. She has organized and contributed to numerous exhibitions and publications, including Underground Modernist E. McKnight Cowfer, After Icebergs, Nature Cooper Hewitt Design Triennial, Fragile Beasts and How Posters Work at Cooper Hewitt, and Making Room, the Space Between Two and Three Dimensions at the Massachusetts Museum of Contemporary Art. She worked previously at the Museum of Modern Art in the Department of Prints and Illustrated Books. Following Caitlin, we will hear from Rachel Jacobs. Rachel is an independent curator specializing in French 17th and 18th century books and prints and 19th century history of collecting. She is currently remote senior research cataloger of the Department of Drawings, Prints, and Graphic Design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, New York, working on the Duclou print collection. She was formerly Curator of Books and Manuscripts at Waddingston Manor National Trust, England, where she continues to work part-time. She has curated several exhibitions at Waddingston, including Alice's Wonderlands, Life, Collections, and Legacy of Alice de Rothschild, Glorious Years, French Calendars from Louis XIV to the Revolution, Royal Spectacle, 18th century court ceremony in books, prints, and drawings, and playing, learning, flirting, printed board games from 18th century France. She joins us today from Toronto. Thank you, Rachel. And following Rachel, we will hear from Elizabeth Sari Brown. Elizabeth is the assistant professor of art history and in and is uh, a member of the Institute for Women's Studies at the University of Georgia. A specialist in 18th and 19th century French sculpture and material culture, her research interests include Rococo aesthetics, the gendering of artistic media and practices, global contact in the Age of Enlightenment, and questions of materiality and art historiography. Her current book project, 
tentatively entitled Modeling Sculpture, Clodion, and the Aesthetics of Terracotta, examines the vases, satyrs, and bacchants and women and children made in terracotta by the French sculptor Claude Michel, called Clodion. Brown is also developing a second project on caricature and cruelty in 18th century ornament. Prior to joining the faculty at the University of Georgia, Brown worked in the curatorial departments of several museums, including Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum, the Museum of Fine Arts Boston, the Santa Barbara Museum of Art, and the Samuel P. Harn Museum of Art. Her work has been published in Art History, the Burlington Magazine, the American Ceramic Circle Journal, the French Porcelain Society Journal, as well as in several exhibition catalogs. I'm just delighted that we have these three distinguished scholars with us today, and we will start with Caitlin. So Caitlin, um, I'll turn it over to you, and we will return um, at the end of the presentations to say some questions. So if you have questions, please uh, type them into the Q&A, and we'll get to as many as we can at the end. Thanks, Caitlin. Thank you so much, Mary, for the lovely introduction. I'm thrilled to be here and so grateful to the IFPDA and the Print Council of America for inviting Cooper Hewitt to participate in Print Month. Over the last two years, my colleagues joining us today have been working on researching, cataloging, and publishing more than 5,000 engravings and etchings from Cooper Hewitt's extraordinary architecture and ornament print collection. Although these holdings have long been known to scholars, they have been seen little by the wider public. The work of cataloging and publishing this collection online is ongoing, but today we wanna to take the opportunity to share the history and the highlights of this remarkable resource. For those who haven't had the opportunity to visit us in person, Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum is located on the Upper East Side in New York. The museum is housed in a Beaux-Arts mansion built as Andrew Carnegie's private home in the late 19th century. The museum was founded in 1897 as the Cooper Union Museum for the Arts of Decoration by two sisters, Sarah and Eleanor Hewitt. The sisters were granddaughters of the industrialist Peter Cooper, who had opened the Cooper Union for the Advancement of Science and Art in 1859. Cooper Union was a free school for men and women, and on the fourth floor of the building, there was a dedicated women's art school. The Hewitt sisters conceived of their new museum to accompany the women's art school with a collection that was designed to be freely accessible and open in the evenings so that working artisans could use it. They modeled the museum on European institutions that were dedicated to the study of decorative arts, particularly the Musée des Arts Décoratifs in Paris. During its formative years, the museum served primarily as a resource for the school and the collection of drawings, prints, textiles, objects, and wall coverings were collected with the aim of offering students a visual vocabulary. In many instances, the Hewitt sisters acquired entire collections from single artists, designers, or schools. Reference books and scrapbooks filled with visual aids were readily available to broaden the visitor's education. Prints were of the utmost importance to the Hewitts, and the earliest works acquired for the museum were over 400 old master engravings and etchings. The sisters strongly believed in the importance of providing access to prints to the general public, just as they had encountered during their annual travels in London and Paris. In the accompanying catalog documenting this first gift to the collection, print scholar Fitzroy Carrington wrote, New York has hitherto been far behind the larger European cities, inasmuch as here there has been no good public collection of engravings and etchings available to the student. Is it not time that this condition of affairs be better? Over the next several decades, the Hewitts focused much of their attention on acquiring works of decorative arts. They were particularly preoccupied with the desire to source premier examples of neoclassical and Rococo designs, which they believed represented the pinnacle of design history. At the time, the market for such prints and drawings was full of opportunity. Sales of significant collections by 19th century collectors and practitioners presented the Hewitt sisters with a unique opening to acquire important works on paper for their new museum. The Hewitts used their vast social circle to build a network of committed supporters, many of whom made further introductions to European specialists and collectors. 
In 1906, the Hewitts were invited to a fortuitous luncheon with a French decorator and collector named Jean-Léon de Clou. De Clou was born in 1840 to a Parisian family of decorators and contractors, and as a young man, he established a gilding shop with his eldest brother. He became passionate about 18th century French decor, particularly the style of Louis XVI. His study of the period enabled him to become a specialist in the signature ornamental painting of that period, and he continued to work as a decorator for clients while frequenting auctions, public sales, and antique shops. Though he had relatively modest means, he amassed a significant collection of drawings, prints, paintings, and objects. By the time the Hewitts met him in 1906, he had focused his attention primarily on collecting. Through the preserved letters from de Clou give a lively insight into his passion and character, but the only known photograph of him is this grainy image on the right. De Clou described himself as charmed by the sisters' practical attempt to familiarize American artisans with the finest forms of French decorative art. He invited the women to his villa in Sevres, France, to see his collection. Over the next 15 years, he worked with and with the sisters and on behalf of them to assemble and eventually sell two major collections to the Cooper Union Museum. In 1911, after many written exchanges with Eleanor Hewitt, de Clou sold the museum hundreds of drawings by some of the most influential French artists and designers. The acquisition and display of these drawings were received in New York with splashy attention and were featured in the New York Times and the Daily Herald. In her 1912 annual report, Eleanor Hewitt described the collection as an untold mine of wealth of suggestions for decorative ideas. Indeed, the drawings that the museum purchased from de Clou remain some of the museum's most studied to this day. Although the drawings were the focus of the first purchase, de Clou had begun discussing the significance of prints from his earliest correspondence with Eleanor Hewitt, as Rachel Jacobs will discuss in more detail shortly. But it was not until 1921 that the Advisory Council of the Cooper Union Museum voted to approve the purchase of the exceptional print collection assembled by de Clou. In one acquisition, the museum acquired 431 bound albums of engravings and etchings for ornament. These albums contain some 13,000 individual prints, most in near pristine condition, a benefit of de Clou's penchant for bindings. The collection spans the 16th through the 19th centuries, though the primary strength is in French material of the long 18th century. Among the influential designers represented are Lepotre, Marot, Berin, Watteau, Boucher, Meissonnier, Hillemont, Delafosse, Openor, and Blondel. During these artists' lifetimes, there was extraordinary interest in the French market for serial prints or pattern books celebrating their work. Talented printmakers translated their innovations in architecture, interior design, and decoration into stunning works of graphic art. The period is considered the high point in ornamental design of this kind, and the collection includes designs for furniture, jewelry, porcelain, metalwork, architecture and interiors, embroidery, tapestries, and wall coverings. In the decades after the albums were acquired, they were used just as the Hewitt sisters intended, as objects for study for students and practitioners alike. The standard museum practices for handling objects were not yet employed, and students could retrieve albums at any time for their perusal. After Sarah Hewitt's death, a memorial library was constructed which housed the de Clou volumes displayed alongside important examples of the de Clou drawings acquisition. In this 1935 photograph on the left, two designs by de Gork are visible. For decades, the most reliable record of the bound ornament print collection was de Clou's own inventory books. Then in 1956, the curator Richard Wonder undertook the first comprehensive inventory of the collection. Wonder's inventory, eventually typed, represented the only cataloging of the collection for many years. That changed in 1999 when the scholar Peter Furing dedicated his time to the research and study of the collection, and several members of the Print Council of America participated in an evaluation of the collection. Furing's comprehensive work completely transformed the scholarly understanding of the de Clou albums and remains a vital on site resource to this day. In recent years, Cooper Hewitt has undertaken a major effort to digitize our collections. In 2016, we undertook a campaign of photography to capture the majority of the de Clou prints. 
And in 2021, on the 100th anniversary of the acquisition, we began the project of comprehensively cataloging and publishing these prints online. My wonderful colleagues, Rachel Jacobs and Elizabeth Sari Brown took up this challenge remotely when Smithsonian COVID-19 regulations prevented us from working on site with the collection directly. Special thanks also goes to my former colleague, Julia Seaman, who was instrumental in the initial phases of our recent undertaking. Happily, we are now able to make the DeClue albums available online and in person by appointment in the Drew Hines Study Center for Drawings and Prints. The collection continues to serve as a source of study and inspiration for designers and artists, as well as for students and scholars. Finally, I would like to take a moment to acknowledge the work of my predecessors, Elaine Evans D, Marilyn Sims, and Gail Davidson, who all dedicated themselves to enhancing the public's access to the drawings, prints, and graphic design collection, and in particular to the study of the DeClue prints. It is a thrill to continue their work and ensure that the DeClue print collection is a vital resource in the 21st century. Thank you. And I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Rachel Jacobs, and I'm going to share my screen for her presentation just a moment. Okay, thank you so much, Caitlin, um, and thank you everyone for participating and to the organizers. It's a, a real pleasure to speak to you today from Toronto. Um, so following on from Caitlin's uh, talk, I'd like to focus a little bit more on the formation of the collection from de Clou's perspective, drawing on his surviving letters written, as Caitlin mentioned, between 1906 and 1911 to Eleanor Hewitt. This fascinating, albeit one-sided correspondence, provides valuable insight into the motivations for creating the collection um, and its intended uses and the value placed on certain artists and designers of the period. Um, it's important to note, as Caitlin mentions, that the um, letters speak about acquisitions of other types of objects and drawings as well, um, but I'm not going to be focusing on these today. As early as August 1907, De Clue mentions the project to create a library of ancient works for the school, stating that such a library is indispensable for a school of decorative arts, for these documents are true sources and are as important as museum objects. This explains their rarity for, as he says, all the current school directors are purchasing similar books and prints, and thus he warns the sisters that if such a project is accepted, it will take many years to build the library. De Clou reiterates in his letters his preference for purchasing directly from collectors and mentions relationships he's cultivated over the years, without naming any names, of course. Um, before the library project is formalized, De Clou is already preparing to send 13 albums of 18th century ornaments, as he puts it. And by 1907, the 13 become 16, which were eventually sent to New York in January 1908. And here um, is a doc is one of the letters which lists these um, these albums, um, these 16 first core albums. Uh, slide, please. The initial founding group of albums um, include two albums of metalwork designs by Jean Francois Forti, and you can see here a beautiful design for an Andiron or fire dog um, by Foin after Forti's designs in one of the albums and seven albums of furniture, vase, and trophies after Richard de la Lande. Uh, slide, please. Here are some beautiful trophies by de la Lande. And with the, um, I, I'm showing the pictures as they appear, the, the slides within their albums, just to give you the full context. And later on in the presentation, I'll zoom in a little bit more so you can have a look at the, at the plates themselves. It is around this time in late 1907 that De Clou also sends a list of foundation works that should be included in a library, stating that these represent the bare minimum for a library of decorative arts. De Clou was inspired by Peter Jensen's catalogue of the Berlin collection, which had been published in 1894, which he mentions in a letter as being under his eyes as he's writing to the sisters and regretting that France no longer has anything as complete as Berlin does. A slide, please. But before we look at the list in some detail, I want to finish describing how this library project developed. Before anything is formalized, De Clou keeps sending albums here and there, mentions purchases he's made, and hoping to interest the Hewitt sisters with such purchases that seem kind of outside of the initial scope. 
uh, such as albums of designs after Jean-Francois de Cuvillier and his son. Um, he mentions um, one purchase of uh, an old binding that he has restored and adds a specially commissioned manuscript title page along with two up and out albums for a total cost of 3,800 francs. And he states that these would be a great uh, starting point for the library. The sisters declined the offer due to the price, um, but he's happy to keep them in, in mind for the sisters just in case they change their mind. Um, and here are uh, these sort of manuscript, beautifully illustrated um, uh, title pages that uh, De Clou has commissioned, has commissioned for his albums. The project changes shape, as Caitlin mentions, when De Clou's nephew and heir dies. And so there's a whole host um, that far of, of these albums that come to the collection that go far beyond the, um, the initial scope. At the time of his meeting, the sisters, he'd already sold parts of his collection at four auctions, two print auctions in 1889. We see the title pages here. Ornament prints don't figure much in these two uh, sales that total 1,721 lots, most likely since he viewed these prints as source material and used them in, in much the same way that he and the sisters wanted the students to use the collection. Um, on multiple occasions, de Clou mentions painted 18th century paneling that he's having restored and repainted based on his documents, as he puts it. Um, de Clou describes eight panels in particular, repainted after pastels by Ranson and after prints by Piment from his own collections. In these accounts, he's reinforcing the usefulness of the collection from the perspective of an artisan director, a decorator rather, um, and successful, successfully building his argument for the necessity of the library. Uh, he doesn't miss the opportunity to mention that these panels would also serve as good models for the students. So now let's look at the foundation list as, as he puts it, a slide please. The title, this is part of the list, as you can see here, uh, is Composition of a library, library of Works of Decorative Arts from the 17th to the 19th century. The list is broken down into periods, Louis XIV, Regency, Louis XV, and Louis XVI, with a further breakdown outlining where completed, of, of a, a completed works of a certain artist or designer are available. Slide, please. Now I'll just show a few uh, examples very quickly from this list. So unsurprisingly, we find the oeuvre of Jean Beret, as Caitlin mentioned. Um, and here is uh, uh, two plates from an album, which was most likely described in the, is, is most likely the same um, album that was in De Clou's personal collection that he describes in the list as being 132 plates bound in what appears to be an 18th century modeled calf binding. And you see on the right, the um, sort of funeral festivities, as we could put it, for the funeral of the Duc d'Orléans, brother to the King Louis XIV, and a wonderful, typically Berrin, um, or panel design with grotesque motifs. Slide, please. Also included are prints after Daniel Moreau, um, and here we see the uh, title page for um, a recueil of plans and architectural elevations and so on. Uh, de Clou says he's, it's impossible to find a completed copy and, he managed, and that he's only managed to gather 120 plates so far. He proposes an alternative to purchase a facsimile based on the Berlin collection that was published in 1892, which further emphasizes the fact that these prints were intended to be used first and foremost as models. Um, the facsimile, interestingly, the facsimile as well as the original uh, prints are now in part of the De Clou collection. And on the right, I just wanted to show you as well uh, a beautiful console table design by Jean Bernard Honoré Thoreau, known as Thoreau, which um, these designs are described by De Clou as very curious and very beautiful models for sculptures in particular, and that in 30 years he's only managed to purchase 73 plates. We of course find the great inventors at Rococo, Messonnier, and Mopanov, and all of the wonderful plates that um, prints that Caitlin has already shown us, so I won't um, say all their names again. Um, but I do want to show you a few more highlights that are that go beyond this initial list that uh, De Clou mentions. And so please, next slide. We have an album containing a beautiful series of designs for stoves, 
produced by a Parisian ceramic manufactory owned by Louis-Francois Olivier. Uh, these designs are by Louis Boss and engraved by Louis Gustave Taraval. The album includes a printed introductory text, along with designs, as you can see, printed in black and also copies um, hand colored. Um, this particular design uh, is described as being uh, per perfect for an orangery so that it blends in with the foliage. Um, most um, Next slide, please. Most of the albums were bound in the early 20th century, uh, but we also find a few fine 18th century bindings, especially for the beautifully uh, engraved festival books and festivities and the prints that record these ephemeral events are sort of a wonderful example of ornament in action um, where designers could really sort of fulfill their, their creativity. Um, here we have the beautiful binding and title page for the festivities uh, celebrated in Strasbourg in 1744 uh, for the arrival of the King Louis XV, published in 1745 after designs by Weiss. And here I was able to identify the, the, the binding by A.M. Padloup, and interestingly, in terms of provenance, which we don't see much evidence of, of earlier provenance throughout the collection, but here we can see, obviously, on the, the covers that there are some heraldic devices in the corners, possibly for the member, for a member of the Swiss de Serrat family. And inside the book, we see the ex libris of the French journalist Louis Edmond Quentin, Marquis de Champsonnet. Uh, who was executed for his writings in 1794. So quite an um, interesting um, provenance there as well. And slide, please. And I want to finish with this, um, another sort of hint to a possible provenance with these wonderful panel designs with arabesque motifs and grotesques by Jacques Leroy after designs by Claude-Louis Deret, published by Jacques-François Chiroux in 1789. And you can see very faintly there in red ink, there's an inscription that says Manufacture de Porcelaine d'Orléans, Le Brun. Um, and so this refers to a porcelain manufactory in Orléans created by Benoit Le Brun in 1792. So it could possibly mean that this series was owned by the manufactory and used as models, I'm not sure. Um, but it's a lovely connection and it sort of brings the whole together of of prints in use by artisans manufacturers in much the same way as the uh, school was intended to use them. Slide please. <laughs> and now moving on to our second part of the talk, um, Liz and I will be discussing a few women represented with the Declue collection, within the Declue collection. And one aspect of our cataloging was uh, to create fuller artist records with more biographical details within um, which allowed us to focus our attention and interest on the women, um, often silent partners within the print world during this period. And I just wanted to uh, highlight that women's roles uh, within the arts and prints are being celebrated right now. And the highly anticipated upcoming publication, Female Printmakers, Print Sellers and Print Publishers, edited by Christina Martinez and Cynthia Roman, and the wonderful talk, uh, Christina's talk last week as part of the programming on Jane Hogarth's publishing, um, which was fascinating. And the exhibition currently on at the Baltimore Museum of Art, later traveling to Toronto, um, making her mark a history of women's artists in Europe. So it's a, it's a good time. Um, as we know, women have always played a key role within the workforce, especially during the period covered by the Duclou collections when businesses uh, and print businesses were uh, family affairs, dynasties being passed down from generation to generation. And women um, worked throughout these businesses, but often remained silent as we know, and only their names become visible once they're widowed and you can see them uh, imprinted on the plates. In some rare occasions, of course, you see the names of unmarried daughters appear as well. Romeo Arbor's Dictionnaire des Femmes Libraires en France manages to provide some statistics with the total number of women working within the French book trade, and he includes uh, within that uh, book binders and also print sellers um, and dealers. Between 1740 and 1870, he's calculated 6,424 women in all of France, and he breaks down the numbers by activity and the total number of print sellers he's managed to uncover uh, 
throughout this whole period is only 65. As I'm working remotely, my findings are limited to the digitized records, but based on 13,460 records, most of which are digitized, I was able to identify so far 10 women publishers and print sellers um, so far. And many of these women's women are have been identified uh, previously in the cataloging uh, that Caitlin's mentioned, so not necessarily new um, uh, discoveries, but will be available searchable online. This may not seem like a significant number, but when we consider Arbor's figure of 65 covering a period of 400 years, the Duclos collection is quite rich in female representation. I'm not suggesting here that the Duclos collection was looking to represent women in particular, but instead the presence of these women are a testament to their success within the trade. Of the 10 women identified so far, the two Shiru widows, Marguerite Caillou, active 1729, to 1755, and her niece and daughter-in-law, Geneviève Marguerite Chiroux, active 1755 to 1768, represent the most prolific within the collection, with over 20 series of prints between them. And I have to credit here the seminal Dictionnaire des éditeurs des à Paris sous l'Ancien Régime for the biographical details that I'll be um, including. So Marguerite Caillou was the daughter of a merchant from Oudin. Her birth date is unknown, but she marries François Chéroux in 1713. And here we have the beautiful, handsome portrait of Chéroux. Um, a celebrated printmaker, publisher, and print seller from Blois. He studied uh, printmaking with Audrin and Revet and became a member of the Académie Royale de Peinture and Sculpture in 1718. And in that same year, he purchases a portion of the Audrin widow stock and the sign De Piliers d'Or at the two golden pillars, which launches his family's print publishing and selling businesses. Slide, please. Here on this wonderful map from the uh, website um, Artists in Paris, Mapping Artists in Paris, the yellow dot represents their address on um, the Rue Saint-Jacques, which of course was the center of the print world um, in during this period in Paris. And so all of their competitors, family members, um, uh, all our neighbors within this street and the adjacent streets. Um, from 1718 until his death in 1729, he acquires um, quality prints and is one of the first publishers interested in plates after the paintings by Watteau. The inventory after his death records 240 plates, estimated at 7,262 livres. Marguerite Caillou takes over the business, which had only been going for just over 10 years, during which time, I want to note, she's given birth to nine children, with only two surviving, Benoit Simon and François II, who becomes a print publisher as well. She manages um, the business, and from 1729, until her death in 1755. She's quick to keep the business going and only a few months later starts advertising uh, for prints that she's selling. Um, she frequently advertises in the Mercure de France with around two to three adverts per year, often for new prints after paintings by Watteau. She obtains privileges in 1730 for a series of prints after Van Loo, Lancre, Poussin, Watteau and Gillot. And I just want to mention one advertisement in 1730 for portraits of the king and queen after Van Loo, engraved by Gilles Edmé Petit and Jacques Chéroux. Here, Margaret is described as la veuve, de, the widow of François Chéroux of the Academy Royal of Painting and Sculpture, an engraver to the cabinet of the king, adding weight and authority to her name and her prints. We can also see her here the importance of networks. Firstly, Jacques Chéroux was her brother-in-law who is also a famous and a successful printmaker. And Gilles de Mepetit was an apprentice of her late husband, Francois, who also happened to marry Margaret's sister, Anne Caillou. A, a good example of her business sense in October 1739, she acquires all the plates and the impressions of the completed of, of Watteau, uh, known as the Recueil de Julien, purchasing them from Jean de Julien, and advertising, advertises that she is selling them for half the price. Here we have an example, which um, Caitlin showed uh, a couple from the same album, of Vato's ornament designs featuring arabesque panels with pastoral, mythological, and allegorical scene within, found within an album of Gillot and Vato prints engraved by Uquier. 
um, these are, this is the production of, of Chiebo. Uh, we also find uh, within the collection Jacques Valentin's ornamental ironwork designs um, from an album. Uh, in here we see featuring heraldic devices and motifs. Um, and slide, please. And a series of floral designs uh, by Charles, floral ornament designs by Charles Germain de saint aubin dedicated to Duchesse de Chevreuse. As well as managing a successful print publishing and selling business, Margaret purchases two houses, one in 1739 and another in 1752, which she rents out. Her tenants in one of the houses from 1752 was the printmaker Nicolas Dauphin Beauvais and his family, whose children also worked in the trade. And I only mention this because um, his daughters who also published prints under the address Chélie Demoiselle Beauvais, so a rare example of unmarried daughters of printmakers publishing under their name. At the time of her death in April 1755, her stock and plates, uh, her stock of plates and prints is estimated to around 23,000, doubly doubling her stock and significantly growing the family business, establishing herself as an important seller um, in the 18th century. Unlike many women within the trade, she doesn't pass on the business to her son, uh, but she does collaborate with him. Her son unfortunately dies a few months before Margaret, which brings us to the next Chevaux widow I want to focus on, Geneviève Marguerite Chevaux. François II marries his first cousin, Geneviève Marguerite, the daughter of his uncle printmaker, Jacques François, who we've mentioned already. Her dowry is used to purchase a stock of plates and prints, and at the time of his early death, the inventory of plates and prints is estimated close to 22,000 livres. In 1755, she therefore takes over the family business, inherits both from her husband and her mother-in-law, slash also aunt, Marguerite, and continues to use the same address, au deux pieds d'or. Another important family connection here is, her, is that her sister, Anne-Louise, marries the uh, famous printmaker and seller, Jacques-Gabriel Huquier. Um, Marguerite, Geneviève Marguerite manages the business under her own name from 1755 to 1768 until she sells her stock to Jacques, her son, Jacques-François, when he's around 25 years old. Despite this relatively short period of time, she continues uh, to run the business successfully, and she represents the most prolific seller in the collection. Anthony Griffiths de describes her as one of the most powerful figures in the Parisian print world. Two series of designs here we can see for tailpieces and print, uh, printer's flowers of Florence after Bachelier's woodcuts for the monumental Audrey edition of De La Fontaine's Fables. Um, and here these uh, woodcuts are especially engraved by Chauffard, for this edition, uh, published by Geneviève Marguerite in partnership with de Montenon, who had the privileges. On the left here, we have a wonderfully dense ornamental hunting trophy featuring all the necessary motifs by the architect and engraver Mathurin Chapitel. And on the right is an album uh, with these wonderful series of cartouche designs by a lesser known artist, uh, Bosch. And I'm showing you, um, these are all published obviously by the, the widow. Uh, next slide, please. And these wonderful vases etched by Personnet, uh, combining these wonderful formal classical motifs, goût de l'antique, goût grec, with, the, with these wonderful natural, with the natural world. And they do, um, making them sort of come alive, uh, much like the designs by um, Pizzito. Um, and a series of these uh, were engraved by Gilles de Marteau in red chalk manner as well. I wanted to show you also two architectural prints uh, from her stock, um, including a plate from a series of designs for chimney pieces on the right by A. Le Canu, and a plan for a second, first and second floor of a building, which I thought was of particular interest because it does um, show in the lower right a boot a shop front, so it could very well be a house that is similar to what a printmaker, a print seller would be uh, living in. The advertisements also attest to her interest in publishing inventive prints based on new technologies, with examples by Louis Marin Bonnet, a slide please, inventor of the Crayon Manor. In the collection, there's an about album of beautiful ornament designs by Bonnet after designs by Chauffard, 
in his red ink crayon manner, imitating drawings in red chalk. The illusion of drawing here works perfectly with this purely ornamental subject of the flowers intertwined with scrolling acanthus leaves on a base, possibly suggesting a design for an environ or fire dog, but it's, it's quite loose. Slide, please. I want to end with a portrait <clears throat> of Geneviève Marguerite's son, Jacques François Chéhou, who purchases her stock and takes over the family business in 1768. In 1776, her maternal grandfather, the printmaker and publisher Jacques Chéhou, sells him his stock, and thus the two branches of the Chéhou dynasty are united. He becomes one of the most important Parisian print publishers of the time and print sellers. But the women in this dynasty uh, are the key figures really in the success and longevity of the family, I think. And this well-known print by Antoine Carré after Benoit Prévost, a portrait of Jacques François, who's elegantly dressed, seated at his desk, contemplating a drawing or print with family portraits on the wall behind, presumably his wife in the upper center oval, uh, framed by portraits of his children, and below are portraits of his parents, Geneviève Marguerite and François de Chiroux. The placements of the two portraits creates a secondary pendant relationship between mother and son, the mother who taught him the trade with the Latin inscription paying tribute to his family. And so after speaking their names, it is only fitting that we end with this extremely rare portrait, putting a name to a face to one of the not so invisible widows of the print world. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me and thank you for uh, Rachel for um, showing all those gorgeous slides. I have to say I never tire of looking at them. They make me so happy every time I see them on screen. Um, so as Caitlin and Rachel have mentioned, one of the priorities in cataloging the clue collection into TMS was to make the women publishers and engravers searchable within the database and in the future, more easily findable on the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum website. Earlier cataloging projects of the DeClue collection, an inventory completed in 1956, and more recent research accomplished by Peter Furing, already recognized the names of many women artists among the more than 13,000 prints. Our hope in promoting these 18th century women printmakers and making their works digitally accessible is to underscore their inclusion in one of the most significant collections of 18th century architecture and ornament prints compiled in the late 19th to early 20th centuries, and to highlight the range of architecture and ornament projects and beyond to which they contributed in the 18th century. Some of the women artists of the Duclou collection may be more familiar than others. Marie-Thérèse Creboul, sometimes known as Madame Vien, owing to her marriage in 1757 to the painter Joseph Marie Vien, was one of the few women members of the French Royal Academy of Painting and Sculpture in the 18th century. Admitted into the Academy in 1757, Creboul Vien showed ornithological, butterfly, and floral paintings at five of the Salon exhibitions between 1757 and 1767. But even before her meeting and marriage to Vian, Rebou was working as a professional artist. Primarily, Rebou Vian was employed in natural history illustration, and her name appears on publications such as Michel Adanson's Natural History of Senegal, published in 1757, and the dissertation on papyrus by the Comte Caillus from 1758, both for which she drew and engraved shell and plant specimens, often directly après nature. Reboul and Vien were married for almost half a century, and throughout their careers and companionship, they collaborated on a number of projects, including a series of vases composed in the style of antiquity. Published in 1760, a complete album of the suite of vases is represented in the Duclou collection. Reboul Vien's participation in the publication is signaled throughout the plates. On the frontispiece, the conclusive Gravé par Marie-Thérèse Reboul, Sa Femme de la Même Académie, to the title identifies Reboul as the engraver of the album and as Vian's wife, Sa Femme, but also as belonging to the same prestigious institution, the Academy, as Vian. On, this, on each subsequent plate, her name is etched lower right, R. Vian S. Reboul Vian Sculpsi, Reboul Vian engraved the image. No mere decoration, the vase in 18th century France was one of the most dynamic arts in form and theory. 
The vase was purportedly the original art object and also represented a merging of all mediums, the proportions of architecture, the materials and ornamentation of sculpture, and the perspective of painting in bas relief. In print, the vase was a site of invention and experimentation, and Reboul and Vian's album of vases was collected as much for the figure's potential manufacture in stone, metal, and ceramic as it was to be enjoyed for the ornament forms in and of themselves. Another name that might sound familiar is that of Blondel, a surname frequently associated with the architects Francois and Jacques-Francois Blondel, and whom uh, Rachel just spoke of. Yet in addition to housing albums by these illustrious architects, the De Clou collection also features the Profilé Ornement de Vase engraved by Marie Michel Blondel, née Vélin, who married Francois Blondel in 1723. Unlike the album by Reboul and Vien, this album does not depict vases invented by the artist, but rather replicates in clear, crisp lines 25 vases that could be found in the French royal gardens of Versailles, Trianon, and Mali, cast or carved in the 17th century by sculptors such as François Giraudon, Claude Bertin, and Jean Hardy. Little is yet known of Marie Michel or her oeuvre. In addition to her album of vases, the primary bibliographies of 18th century ornamentists list only one other album of prints by her, an album of trophies and fantastical helmets. Yet, as the title page advertises in the same graceful italic font below Marie Michel's name, the Profil et Ornement was published with the privilege of the king. Control over the print reproduction of the buildings, paintings, and sculptures comprising the royal collection through exclusive privilege prevented the production and circulation of poor quality prints by unauthorized artists. While the Blondel likely secured the privilege owing to Francois's position as architect to the king, the privilege also attests to Marie Michel's skills and renown as an engraver as an artist permitted by the superintendent of the king's buildings to reproduce works of art from the royal collection. Moreover, while the ink issued within the wake of Marie Michel's Buren seems set to simply communicate the proportions of the vase's form and their surface decorations, they also appear, via the fine line work of Mascaron, Garland, Ranceau, and Ries, capable, as with contem other contemporary album of vases, of transformation and translation contributing to the diffusion and appreciation of ornament motifs of and on the vase. Now vases are among the most frequent motifs in the albums of architecture and ornament prints that make up the De Clou collection and on which women artists work. Worked. Um, another woman engraver represented in the collection is Marianne Rousselet. In an album of six new vases, Rousselet engraved original drawings by Maurice Jacques her name lettered lower right in the title page, M. Rousselet F. Tardieu Sculpt. On the subsequent plates, however, her name has been replaced by that of Daumont, the publisher of the series, Jean-Francois Daumont. Like many artists and artisans of the 18th century, Marianne Rousselet was part of a larger network of artists, which included family members who were engravers and sculptors in the Royal Academy, as well as her husband, Pierre-Francois Tardieu, an engraver and cartographer. But Marianne Rousselet, like Reboulvian, was also integrated within a network of natural historians, putting her Buren too toward publications by some of the most noted scientists of the day, including the Comte de Buffon, whose 36 volumes of Histoire Naturelle were among the most popular and best-selling books of the 18th century. When the Histoire Naturelle first appeared in 1749, 20,000 volumes sold in just six weeks, and the tomes were re-editioned three times by 1750, that is, within one year of publication. Marianne Rousselet was responsible for engraving, among other species, a number of the picturesque plates in the nine volumes dedicated to the natural history of birds, including that of the jacana pictured here, native to coastal waterways of Africa. The work by women engravers in the De Clou collection, however, is not only comprised of vases. Elise Caroline Liotier and her older sister, Françoise Charlotte, whose works are sometimes inscribed La Jeune et L'Aînée, uh, the Younger and the Elder, respectively, 
engraved many of the plates after drawings by Gilles Paul Covet for his album of ornament, uh, ornament designs for use by young artists destined for the decoration of buildings. Their work included engraved designs for panels, grotesque masks, uh, rinceau, and chimney pieces, and which, in paper form, might also have been utilized in decoupage, or, like the vases discussed earlier, enjoyed for their own ornamental playfulness. Elizabeth Hossard, meanwhile, was responsible for several of the title-bearing escutons for the map, uh, maps to be found in the French Royal Guard, sorry, wrong page, in the Universal Atlas by Robert de Vaugrandy. These rocaille designs, with their scroll and shell work, their hanging nets, dripping verdure, and abundant foliage, are distinct in style from the plates of the Histoire Naturelle that she, like Marianne Rousselet, as well as Elizabeth's sister, Catherine Hossard, also produced, suggesting a flexibility of technical translation, of her ability to maneuver her hand and wrist and burin to both florid and exacting lines. In addition to those carving into the metal plate, images designed by themselves or by another illustrator, women engravers in the Declou collection also included calligraphers, those responsible for elegantly transcribing explanatory text. Such is the example of Marie F. Lettre, née Verard, whose name as Scrip appears in the Declou collection within albums such as that celebrating the public festivals given by the city of Paris on the occasion of the marriage of the Dauphin. Wed to the engraver and publisher Jean Lettre, it is also likely that Marie Lettre carved the text to a set of hand fans depicting maps of France, the Western and Eastern hemispheres, and Europe, Africa, Asia, and America. On one side decorated with a rococo border ornamented with flowers, acanthus leaves, sea scrolls, and ribbons, the reverse features lengthy description of France's government structure and regional divisions. Marie Lettre did, after all, work on maps, an example of which includes one depicting the phases of a lunar eclipse visible in Paris in 1764. And I apologize for the image on the left. It is not part of the Declou collection. Uh, this map, as has been noted, is interesting as being signed by three women, with the names of three women. That of the individual who calculated the passage of the shadow of the moon, Nicolas Le Put, wife of watchmaker and mathematician, Jean-André Le Put, the engraver of the text, Madame Latre, i.e. marie F. Latre, and the engraver of the cartouche, Madame Tardieu, born Elizabeth Claire Tournay, wife of engraver Jacques Nicolas Tardieu, and related by marriage to Marie Anne Rousselet Tardieu, uh, whom I discussed earlier. However, when the Mercure de France announced the publication of the print, these women's labors were attributed to their spouses as being, and I quote, calculated by Monsieur de la Pote, the geographical portion engraved by Monsieur Latre, and for the ornaments, Monsieur de Tardieu. With the extraordinary number of albums and prints comprising the Declou collection, there are other women engravers whose work still requires cataloging and further research. These include, among others, Marie-Thérèse Martinet, who engraved trophies after ornaments such as Alexis Perrot, Suzanne Elizabeth Sauvet, known for her skill engraving portraits, and Fonbonne, who worked with academicians such as Lambert Sigisbert Adin to replicate his drawings of sculptural restorations, and also one Mademoiselle Tuvenin. Making visible their extensive contributions within the Declou collection demonstrates the greater participation of women artists in 18th century print culture than is generally thought, and highlights their role in some of the most significant architecture and ornament print albums in the 18th century and as collected or and as held in the Declou collection. Thank you. Thank you so much for this marvelous presentation, Elizabeth, Rachel, and Caitlin. Um, there are so many questions that spring to mind. I'd like to start, if I may, with uh, a question to, I think this should go to Rachel. Um, can you tell us more about the bound albums? In particular, I'm wondering about why De Clue chose to to put his prints in in bound albums, and if he purchased any of them that way, or it was his own decision. Thank you, Mary, for the question. Um, I wanted to speak a bit more about, but there's too much to talk about. <laughs> so he, I think the the because they were meant to be 
um, used sort of practically. So an album is kind of the most useful use of, of you know, you can turn the pages easily. And there's a long tradition of, of finding um, print collections in albums. So he's also um, in line with that kind of illustrious tradition. Um, he, in the letters, he mentions often rebinding um, albums or restoring old binding. So it's a, it's a, and he talks about the added costs of that. And he gives advice to the Hewitt sisters about how they should bind the albums. So some, there's a couple, the, in the first lot of albums that he sends, the 16 um, albums, he tells them that they should rebind them all based on the 40 albums in that collection. So I couldn't, I think in looking at that, I think they've been rebound since then. So they, they, anyway, but to answer your question, um, so he, most of them, he has rebound. They've been later rebound uh, in once they, in some cases, once they're in the collection, some albums um, were restored and rebound. But there are also, as I mentioned, what he, he makes a sort of distinction between old, ancien livre, old books and albums too. So he is collecting um, those. And as I mentioned, the um, festival books are often in kind of 18th century bindings. There's another a festival book I didn't show, which show uh, festivities, a group of, of prints um, compiled together by the Menu Plaisir in France, showing various uh, ephemeral festivals. Um, and that's bound in a beautiful uh, Morocco binding with an actual, um, uh, with the, the binder's uh, trade card or pasted into it, Vant. So there's also evidence of, of that. Um, and then there's also uh, most of the 18th century bindings are are not kind of the uh, examples of the fine uh, fine sort of red Morocco gold tooling, but but still very nice with kind of modeled calf and and kind of the normal what you'd find for a a, a good quality library, but not your wow pieces. Does that answer? So it was a bit of a ramble, but I think. <laughs> Sorry, need to unmute. Thank you, Rachel. Um, I'd like to ask Caitlin sort of a practical question. One, Caitlin, how can um, how can we access this collection? You said it's being digitized. Is it already available? Will that be ongoing? Or are you going to wait until everything is ready to go? Um, excellent question. I was just um, exchanging messages with Liz because I was hoping to share links in the chat, um, which isn't seeming to work. So um, everything that has been done by Rachel and Liz is available online on um, Cooper Hewitt's website and also in the Smithsonian Collection Search website. And I actually strongly recommend to scholars to look closely, oh, thank you so much, uh, Michelle, uh, to look closely at the um, Collection Search website of the Smithsonian, which has a sort of more rigorous search function and allows for more detailed um, information pulled from the level of publisher, printer, series title that Rachel and Liz have detailed in the TMS cataloging. So the work is ongoing. Every few weeks, we add more works to the collection sites in both cases, um, but a little over 5,000 have been added over the course of the last year, um, representing the work of Liz and Rachel. And I've also included the link to the Cooper Hewitt Study Center's website, which has the general line for the department. And so any inquiries about seeing the collection or about the resources that we have for the DeCoup collection can be directed there. Uh, Liz and Rachel and I also maintain an active spreadsheet. So for people who are really interested, I can send that um, when requested. Another question, if I may, um, Caitlin, is uh, you, you mentioned that this project. It start was started much earlier, but it really came uh, to into focus uh, around 2020, 2021. And of course, we're in pandemic lockdown. Can you tell me about how you assembled this wonderful team of researchers with the specialized knowledge and how you um, managed to proceed while working remotely? Um, well, I feel very fortunate, and I credit Julia Seaman, former member of our team, with also assisting on this in the early stages. Um, as many of you know, the Smithsonian had very strict regulations um, during the COVID pandemic, and we were not permitted on site um, for a very extended period of time, more than 18 months. 
And we didn't want to stop the work of the important work we were doing around trying to move forward with the collection. Because we had digitized a large portion of the Declu collection, and because so many resources um, that had only been available in person when Peter Furing had done his work in 1999 and 2000 were now digitally available, we decided to conceive of a completely remote project. Um, we became aware that Rachel, who's an expert in this material, might be available. Um, and we were really fortunate that the timing of the Smithsonian grant came through to be able to bring her on um, part-time. And we then, after she did some work to develop a sort of standards manual for us and get a sense of how we should approach the project, we brought Liz on part-time, um, who was busy um, based in Georgia. So Rachel was based in Toronto, Liz was based in Georgia. Liz has managed to be at Cooper Hewitt twice to see the collection in person, I believe. Rachel is actually coming for the very first time next week. Um, some of you will meet her in person. And I always say um, it's ideal to do cataloging in person. It wouldn't have been how I would have originally chosen to do the project. But the COVID pandemic made us all aware, I think um, everyone on this call, how important online resources were. So it actually was a challenge for us and an exciting project for the Smithsonian to try to undertake and think about how we could make the best use of it. There are a few limitations in the cataloging as a result, and Liz and Rachel could speak a little bit more about that if they wanted. Um, so there is things left to do in some of the cataloging work that they've taken on. Uh, Rachel will be continuing to work part-time remote and part-time on-site with us. Liz, we've lost to a wonderful tenure position <laughs> at the University of Georgia. But Rachel and Jacob, do you want uh, Rachel and Liz, do you want to talk a little bit more about the challenges or the opportunities of remote cataloging? Liz, do you want to start or I, um, I, well, I mean, it's, it's a fun, like you said, it was a great opportunity, especially with where I was before, um, and I'm still affiliated, but with Hudson Manor, we were furloughed, and uh, the idea that you have all this time, I mean, I understand why we were furloughed, but when you have all this, this time that could be used towards the cataloging, which is the, the base of kind of your curatorial work, and to not be able to do that, being able to jump onto this project was really kind of a wonderful opportunity and really fulfilling. Um, yeah, obviously there's there's limitations. The photographs are wonderful quality, um, but yes. Yeah, so we things when you have specific questions, obviously with uh, technique and and obviously dimensions, you're not getting a grasp of. So there's limitations there with little things to double check um, here and there. But overall, it's been quite quite good. I was lucky in that at Wadsden Manor, there's a lot of crossover with the ornament collection. So I was, I have in the past worked with a lot of the similar, similar prints in person. <laughs> so at least I had that kind of muscle memory there. But um, it was a, it was really a, a fun project and, and a good challenge to, to think about how to tackle it. And it, the Smithsonian, it, Cooper Hewitt, you were all so wonderful and accommodating and it was wonderful. It is wonderful. It's ongoing. <laughs> Thank you. And I was going to just add, you know, as um, challenging as it was to be remote and away from those resources, um, you know, and just getting to, you know, play with the prints in person, which was such a joyous experience when I went to go visit, um, you know, everything was made available to us as quickly as possible. Um, in addition to the prints, there are also, you know, binders of notes and of research that had been previously done, um, and which had, was not part of the TMS record initially. And anytime, you know, we needed those records, especially after a couple of months, there was someone who could go on, on site, um, photograph, scan those records for us and get them to us so that we could, you know, corroborate our research, what we had accomplished with what had previously been done as well. Um, so it was, you know, um, you know, a new experience working remotely, but it certainly worked out well for, I think, all of our situations. Um, for sure. And I'll clarify for anyone who doesn't spend their time cataloging, uh, TMS refers to the museum system. It's our database used by many, um, many museums around the country. Um, here's a question that came in, and perhaps this is for you, Caitlin. Uh, you mentioned that these are it's an ongoing project. Um, are there any prints that were too fragile to photograph? Um, and how are you dealing with that? 
And then uh, to what extent, what percentage of the Duclu collection is available online currently? Wonderful question. So um, we have photographed about 9,000 of the 13,000 and change prints that make up the bound ornament collection, Duclu specific. Um, Cooper Hewitt continued to collect uh, ornament, both bound and unbound. And But the Duclu collection is a premier collection because it's sort of distinct. We decided to focus our attention on it um, for now. The reason that we didn't digitize the remainder of the collection in 2016 into 2017 was because of condition. That tends to not be um, the issue with the prints themselves, but actually the bindings, which haven't necessarily held up as well over time. And we were doing an experimental rapid capture project with high resolution photography. One of the things we thought about at the time, or I thought about was trying to think how the images would be used well into the future. And we decided to digitize the books in such a way that if we wanted to be able to do a sort of digital flip through of the books down the road, which we don't have the capability or the wireframe at the moment to do, but which I think would be a long-term dream for access, we decided to do the digitization project with that in mind. So all of the bound prints that we did photograph, which about 9,000, were digitized in that way. And those images appear online. And one of the things I found is that it also helps to avoid misleading information. It's easy, as you saw in my presentation, when you see some beautifully cropped images to the plate mark, to not understand that the objects are actually bound together. So that was a, a decision we made. The remainder of the prints are something that we want to pursue digitization of. They'll require some conservator handling um, and repairs of the bindings. And because of the remote nature of a lot of the work over the last couple of years, we focused our attention on the cataloging. The images are actually all available online. It's just a challenge, um, I admit, to find them when there's no metadata to search with. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, I should mention that we are recording this. I know some people have to to drop off as um, as time allows, um, but we'll probably just go to uh, one or two more questions. Um, I also want to introduce Deborah Wood, who is our Vice President of Print Council of America and has been here throughout uh, uh, gathering talks and promoting work by Print Council of America. Um, I would like to uh, turn it back now to Jenny Gibbs. It looks like we are just about ready to wrap up in terms of time. Um, Jenny, I want to thank you again for including us and thank you for putting together this marvelous month of programming and soon to happen an amazing week of the IFPDA print fair in person. Thanks, Mary. <clears throat> Thanks to our friends at Print Council of America and Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Uh, thank you, Mary, Caitlin, Rachel, Liz, for that excellent program. And I hope that you all can join us tomorrow uh, at 12 noon Eastern for what is always one of the highlights of Print Month, uh, Print Study Day presented by the Metropolitan Museum of Art. And this year, the focus is on technical innovation and sociopolitical impact in the 19th and 20th century. Um, so we hope to see you tomorrow and we hope to see you at the Javits Center next week. Bye everyone. Thank you.